Hey guys, I'm just going to talk through the figurative language chapter five and highlight a few things about your poems that might be a little bit helpful for you. Okay. Um, so figurative language in general, I think one of the good statements that's made about that is that when you're using figurative language, you're saying something less than what you mean, more than what you mean, the opposite of what you mean, or something other than what you mean. In other words, you're not, you're not being literal, right? And to accomplish that, usually you're making some kind of comparison, right? And that's what these things are uh, about. And we've got all kinds of things in our language um, that I give some examples of here um, that technically are figurative language. Um, but they're used so often that we don't even think about them. Some people call this dead metaphors, right? But the ones that you're gonna see in a good poem are things that are gonna be unfamiliar. They're gonna be a, a comparison that is unlikely, right? And forces us, um, like our new teacher from Georgia tells us, to think about um, the main subject by using the comparison subject in a different way, shed some light on it, a different perspective, a different way of thinking about something. Okay. Saying one thing and meaning another. Uh, simile and metaphor are the two basic ones, right? And really, mostly the big difference is uh, that simile is a little bit more obvious, right? And it doesn't, uh, and, it, and it's, it's, I would say it's, it, it literally states it as figurative, right? Because it uses the word like most often, but can also use as, then, similar to, resembles, or seems, okay? So any of those basically mean the same thing and they're establishing um, a figurative relationship, an unlikely comparison. But it's letting you know that it's doing that because it's using one of those words, whereas a metaphor is a little more subtle. Okay, so you can see in the poem Harlem, and I definitely think it would be a good idea to at least glance at some biographical information about Langston Hughes, uh, one of the most famous 20th century African American poets. Um, and Harlem is, of course, uh, a neighborhood in New York City that during his lifespan would have been, you know, kind of a troubled, difficult place uh, for most people, even though there's a lot of wonderful things going on too. Um, and you have a whole lot of one particular type of figure of speech through this poem. It's short, okay, but you want to really think about each one intensely and try to um, really, you know, analyze it to death. Look at all the sounds in there and the images and what kind of connotations they have and what does all that add up to? Do you know what the word deferred means? If you don't, you need to look it up, right, because it's going to be crucial to it. That's what pe most people think of. They almost call, they call this poem a dream deferred because it's such a famous line. Um, and then it kind of switches to something else in the final line. If you read those discussion questions, it'll lead you toward what kind of devices are going on there and how you might kind of figure those out. Okay, it's a small poem, but a lot packed in there. Okay, then we get into metaphors, right? And it tells us that metaphors can take four different forms. And it has to do with whether each side of the metaphor is literal or figurative, figurative, or if it's, and if it's stated or implied. So you can see how you can have four different combinations there. I'm not gonna to try to say them all, but if each side can be one or two of those things, then you have four different combinations of them. And there's actually a little chart after the next poem on page 730 that kind of illustrates that. So you're gonna have demonstrations of those different types of metaphors going on in both bereft by Robert Frost. Make sure you look up what the word bereft means because it's the title, it's obviously important. Um, there's definitely a very specific kind of mood going on there and there's definitely kind of an extended thing going on. Definitely look through the discussion questions there too. I don't think Frost's bio is quite as important there. It's not like uh, quintessential to his life or anything like that. Okay, um, it even tells us that in the fourth form over in 729, that both the literal and figurative terms are implied. Now that would be a really hard metaphor to figure out. If there's two things being compared, neither of them are named. The literal is not named and the figurative is not named. Right? They're both only implied. So that's take a lot of talent to write that. So of course we have Emily Dickinson who can, you know, is just one of the greatest poets ever. And think about grammar with this one. It sifts from lead and sifts. What do we have a, a, a perfect example of which continues throughout the poem? It, 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 it. Got to figure out what that antecedent is, right? Got to figure out the antecedents of reference. So make sure you figure, really the key to the whole poem is figuring out what it is. So I'll, I'll definitely drop in on you guys tomorrow and see if you figure that out because you certainly have to figure that out to get anywhere with this poem. And it's not so much a story and it's not so much a huge revelation about human nature as much as it is just a really interesting perspective. So kind of think about that, figure out what it is and kind of look through those questions to help you kind of sift the details. Okay, so we have the handy chart on page 730 that kind of illustrates all those literal versus figurative, stated versus implied combinations that form different metaphors and to some degree similes. 
Then finally, we get into personification. A personification is basically a metaphor, but it is always giving attributes of a human being to usually an object or a concept, maybe sometimes animal, but it, it doesn't quite say as much then. Okay? So it's a subtype of metaphor. Um, also tells us personifications differ in the degree to which they ask the reader to actually visualize the literal term in the human form, like how far it goes. It could be really subtle or it could be you know, somewhat uh, extended, like an extended metaphor. The author to her book was already covered in the video, right? And we have uh, this book being compared to not just a human, but a child. And then that personification slash metaphor is extended throughout that poem, right? But nobody's doing a presentation on that. So let me go over to 732. And we're told that there is an extension of personification called apostrophe. Yes, the word is just like the punctuation mark, okay? So which consists of addressing someone absent or dead or something non-human as if that person or thing were present and alive or any combination of those or could reply to what is being said. So it's an imaginary conversation. It's a one-way conversation in which you are addressing something, a star, a ship, a tree, someone who is dead. You could almost say, in a way, is my team of plowing is almost an apostrophe because that conversation can't really happen, right? But instead the poet creates an artifice in which it does seem to be happening. But in between the lines, it's kind of an apostrophe because really what it is, is a guy kind of trying to work out his guilt about where he's moving in his life after his friend has passed away, right? It was kind of an odd combination there. So we do have one group doing Bright Star by John Keats. It would be useful to look up some biographical information about John Keats. He died young. He knew he was going to die. Maybe look up what the deal is with that. Um, okay, we do have a sonnet here. You might not notice that since it's split between two pages. It's more of a Spencerian sonnet. Excuse me, not Spenterian, uh, Petrarchan sonnet, which means an 8 6 instead of a 4 4 4 2. Art, night, part, eremite, task, shores, fallen, mask, moors, unchangeable, and then uh, unchangeable breasts, well, unrest, breath, death. Never mind the specific rhyme scheme, we're not getting into that yet, but look for the turn. You can probably imagine where the turn is. I think it's a pretty clear word signaling the turn, and right after it, we see the word yet, I'm kind of giving it away there. And then we see the repetition of a certain word that's bring about a contrast to the thought or the example, the sentiment that's expressed in the first eight lines of the poem. And something else is going on there too. That, that definitely, this is a very real poem. It connects to something he was certainly going through in his life. I'll tell you that much. Okay? And it's a little bit more difficult. Okay, Come and make sure you guys are doing okay with it. But again, look through the discussion questions on that one. Let them kind of guide you. And as far as the end of the chapter, we're not going to worry about synecdoche and autonomy yet. They're not applying to the poems. They're here. They're a little bit more subtle and difficult, but we'll kind of mention them in class. All right. So hope everybody watches us today. Hope you are scheduling meetings to uh, really get the most out of this and over the weekend if necessary. And uh, just as a heads up, we are going to wrap up this unit once we talk about a little bit more, excuse me, about writing about poems. And I'm thinking we're probably going to have the MCQ and FRQ on Thursday and Friday at the end of next week, like we did last time. I know there's some other people, some other teachers doing evaluations, but they're not trying to do it literally all at the same time. Like Mr. Uh, Ms. Vaughn is doing it two, two different times during the day. She has an afternoon session. And I think Ms. Chisholm, uh, or no, Mr. Weaver is doing something that's kind of spread out. Mr. Reeve is doing something spread out between eight and two. Okay, so think ahead about that, and we'll be doing something split between second and third. And you guys can keep me informed if there seems to be any other conflicts coming up. All right, I'm done. Good luck. See you tomorrow.